In reality, what it comes down to is most 99.999% of the times I'm teaching, it's something that the Lord just nails me on. Just bunk. I'll be reading and it just jumps out and it's impacted me. You know, the knife goes in me, so now I want to take it out and I want to start putting it in everybody else type of mentality. Um, and so that's really what most of my teaching is, is stuff that the Lord's just, you know, while I'm reading his word, the Holy Spirit just like jumps something out at me and I never saw that before or whoa, you know, and that's, and I'll build it around that. Hey guys, welcome to the Expositors Collective Podcast, episode 166. I'm your host, Mike Neglia, and the voice that you heard is our guest for this special bonus episode, uh, Dan Ewing. Now, uh, this conversation is so much fun. Um, Dan and I are actually old friends. We go back 20 years. And so there's a real vibe in this conversation of old friends catching up. Uh, but also, it's, uh, it's two preachers of God's Word who are trying to uh, be honest um, with ourselves, honest with the congregations, and honest about God's Word. Um, this is, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, the conversation uh, bounces from exciting and thrilling conversation um, topic to the next, and uh, I know that you're definitely not going to be bored. Uh, Dan is a bivocational preacher. He is a, a full-time uh, leather worker and uh, designer, and in the midst of that, he manages to uh, be a frequent, regular guest speaker and preacher at uh, local churches uh, throughout the Juneau, Alaska community. So uh, that is uh, very exciting. And uh, here's something else that's exciting. I am going to tell you about this episode's sponsor. And the sponsor for this week is Sermon Boss. Sermon Boss is an audio, video, live streaming platform which comes with a podcast that you can easily integrate into your church's website and church app so that you will no longer need to send your people anywhere else to find your teachings. In fact, let me, let me interrupt. In the, um, in the end of this interview, I ask Dan, hey, where can people find your sermons? And it is the most like complicated, convoluted answer. Sermon Boss would help with problems like that. Sermon Boss will allow people to easily search for, find, discover, even customize a personal playlist from your teachings right from your website. Sermon Boss easily integrates with other platforms, so you can keep your YouTube, Vimeo, or Facebook followers without having to send people away from your website to find your live stream and your previous messages. So go to sermonboss.com today and schedule a free online demo and see how easy it is to make your teachings more accessible and make an even greater impact for the kingdom of God. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you, Sermon Boss. All right, so thanks to Sermon Boss for sponsoring this episode. If you're interested in sponsoring a, a future episode of the show, uh, get in touch, and, uh, and we will uh, love to uh, work out something with you. Um, and finally, before I let you listen to the episode with, uh, with Dan Ewing, uh, let me say, if you're listening to this episode as it comes out, uh, if you're listening to this in uh, the early half of May, uh, let me just say, we have an ongoing giveaway right now on our social media. So on our Facebook, on our Twitter, on our Instagram, uh, we're doing giveaways of six copies of Scott Erickson's books. Um, he was our guest for the last episode. He actually is a, a mutual friend of myself and Dan's, and uh, we get to give away some of his books. So visit our social media so that you can enter yourself into that competition and that you might win yourself a book. All right, so after all of that, it is my great pleasure and my honor to introduce you to my old friend, Dan Ewing. Hey, welcome to the Expositors Collective Podcast. I'm here with my old friend, Dan Ewing. Hi, Dan. How are you? Hey, good, man. How are you? 
Good. Uh, I haven't seen you face to face, and I, this kind of counts, but I haven't seen you face to face for 20 years. This is kind of our first converse, real conversation in about. Uh, we, we had a phone call maybe three I mean, or face four to or five face years ago. Ish. Yes, 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 yes. Before, before Zoom existed. Zoom to Zoom. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So uh, to introduce you, I've kind of, you know, uh, in the intro, I've talked a little bit about you. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so I know you. I met you, I think, the very first day of, of Bible college. Uh, you and I both were at the Calvary Chapel Bible College in Marietta, California. And it was like, it was September of 2001. Yeah, because like, I remember the... Yeah, the event. The, the, yeah. Um, but I, I got there and I didn't know anybody. And uh, I saw some guy with tattoos and I was like, oh, there's my friend. We'll be friends. I'll be friends with him. That's and, right. I was uh, like, hey, there's a guy with dreads. <laughs> <laughs> there's yeah. a punk rocker. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so it's been great to, to keep in touch uh, uh, a little bit, not as much as maybe we could have or should have, but it's great to, to reconnect. You um, are in I- Ireland, to be fair. Yeah, and you're in Alaska. How <laughs> how was your Bible college experience? Because we had one semester together, and then you were just gone. And then I was just gone. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't, um, you know, Bible, when I went to Bible college, it was kind of a, almost, I look back now, and it was almost like a quick fix to try to uh, clean myself up off drugs, which lasted a short while in Bible college. And then in Bible college, I got, I got right back into drugs. You know, I met people, um doing that type of stuff there. So I got sucked right back into it. And so I, I would say I was not serving the Lord while I was in Bible college by any stretch of the imagination. But the Lord was still working on me there, which is is, is crazy. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, was there like kind of lessons from Bible college that came back later on or was it just a, a blip? I would say, f- I would say friendships more than okay. anything. Okay. Um, you know, and people are always, I'd, even in my worst, you know, I'd think about people there and think, and so, um, and that was always helpful. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, you and I, we were- I don't a, remember uh, much. Okay. So, <laughs> oh, people. well, that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you remember we, you and I, we were in a grindcore band called I do Stab, remember, yes. Stab to yeah. Death. That's uh, what I remember. That was, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, probably a, a Bible college highlights maybe, or, uh, so- Really appreciate your your blast beats in the background. Do you remember my... printing out like Old Testament like verses and going and putting them up on things yeah. with me? You remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, <laughs> there's stuff in the Bible, like just brutal Old Testament stuff and taping it up around Bible call. I'm yeah, <laughs> yeah, sanctified graffiti. Um, yeah. yeah, we're troublemakers, but okay. So, but today, so uh, we're we're still sanctified troublemakers, but not not as much anymore. Um, yeah, so, we've mellowed out. Yeah, so you're you're like um, involved like in in ministry up there in in Alaska uh, alongside yeah. like your your vocation. Um, but so maybe we'll get to that in a second. But could you like talk to us about the first time that you ever like taught the Bible? The first time I ever talked to ta- you know actually did a, a full teaching was at um, Calvary Fellowship, which is a Calvary Chapel here in Juneau, Alaska, and our pastor was on a sabbatical for a year and I was the assistant pastor. And um, you, do you know Al James, any of the Poyman ministry guys? I, I know some Poyman guys, but not not him. So so Al James was a uh, Calvary Prescott and then stepped, handed it off. And so he came up and, and the first time I taught, I taught on a Father's Day and taught the character of a father looking at the life of Joseph. I figured if Jesus is who we want, you know, who we're trying to imitate, then his father, his earthly father, Joseph, um, you know, how did he train him? What was he like? How did his character? And so really looked at that. And it actually wasn't as horrible as probably a lot of people's because I probably studied 60 to 80 hours on that and then had to do it in front of Al before. Um, so it might have been one of my better teachings. No, yeah, no. Yeah, I mean, it was well, still, you know, yeah. <clears throat> it was so I, I'm comfortable in front of people. And so there was that there wasn't that awkwardness. It was more. Um, I was still early in my, in my relationship with Jesus. And so, um, I probably said some things that might've offended people, uh, <laughs> you know, um, 
But I well, remember it still. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of a, a lot of that's that's great. I'm 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 thrilled to hear that it, that it went well. And probably uh, sounds like a, a big ingredient to that. In addition to your study, was was the kind of coaching that you got? In the coaching, advance? heavy coaching. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I went through. I mean, it wasn't me because I was going through his format of teaching. Okay. Um, you know, laid down and just kind of inserted all my stuff there. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I know that like, you know, my early teaching, uh, and, and a lot, and I don't think this is specifically a, a Calvary Chapel thing, but maybe like this, this, this kind of church is, is kind of like encouraging just like, yeah, just go for it. Just, you know, preach the word, um, without kind of the involved coaching that you got. Um, you know, I, I remember teaching, uh, I think I was, it was maybe my second semester of Bible college, actually, uh, being invited back to my home church to do this kind of like this youth thing. And it was just like, okay, it's Saturday night, just share whatever you feel led. And I'm just like, oh, okay. And, you know, I put some stuff together and I think it was okay. But like, but there was no checkup. There was nothing. It was just like, there was no follow up. There was no. Yeah. And I didn't have to like submit my notes or, or even tell them what text it was. Just, just show up, just say whatever I want. Like from like an authority. What's the Lord put on your heart? And yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. So I think the coaching you got is really, is really valuable. Um, the coaching and, and then after, you know, the coaching after is huge. So you got kind of a feedback session as well a too. feedback. I learned, you know, you, you learn all your little ums and you know, your little idiosyncrasies and things like that that you're like, well, I got to work on that. <laughs> uh-huh, know? uh-huh. Uh, but the feedback was huge. Yeah. You said that you, um, you said that y- now I'm conscious of all of my ums. Cause you just, <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Cause you, we do it in conversation. Then you get on in the pulpit and it's kind of <laughs> yeah. clean it up a bit, but what, uh, so if it, you were joking, but if that was your best sermon ever, <laughs> what, what was your next one? Like, was, was there a time when, when you had to like leave the nest and fly on your own? I, you know, it, where I was then, I didn't get a lot of teaching opportunity. The only reason I did is because our pastor was on sabbatical. And so all these Poyman guys came in and came aside me. And, and I was, I was for all intents and purposes, the pastor, you know, I had the authority in that church at that time. And, and then um, when our pastor came back, the Lord had called us to, to called me to step down. We had no clue why. And then two weeks later showed us he was moving us, um, I think it was within two months we had sold our house, bought in a house in uh, near Portland, Oregon, Vancouver, Washington, and we were there. So I didn't teach again, um, maybe other than a Wednesday night Bible study until um, until I was pastoring in in the Portland area. Is that right? Okay, okay. And yeah. so you mentioned that you were kind of like following like a template uh, from yeah. the Poyman. Sorry, what was the the Poyman guy's name? Al James was his name. Al James. So you Al James, he was from Calvary Prescott. So you were following like Al James kind of templates, uh, at least for those early ones. Uh, yeah. And then, then you got to go down to Portland. And were you given kind of a template there as well? No, I was, I was thrown in. So I went, we went to Portland. We still had no reason. We, you know, I always figured it was my business because I do leather work. And, and I figured, okay, God's moving us. And that's, you know, I kind of actually felt like the Lord was sidelining me from ministry. Um, are showing me that this isn't what ministry has to be or something. And, and we go, we moved down there and, and we, the church, first church we walked into Crossroads Community Church, um, we just were there. We loved it. And three months later, they had hired me um, as a full-time pastor to take two pastor's positions. So I was really thrown into the fire um, with it. And here's young adults and, you know, you're teaching monthly and then it became weekly for three years and, um, but my first sermons were pretty rough there, I would say. You know, I would say probably the roughest sermons were when I got back from India. Okay. And because the Lord just really did something and seeing the excitement of those guys, it sparked this excitement in me. And I came back and I was just like this excited over the top. And and I already kind of am. So it was like mm-hmm. a little much. And, mm-hmm. and yeah, I mean, the camera guys hated me. Oh, they didn't right. hate me. I mean, they were just but people were pacing, literally. Yeah. Oh, literally! One day, this lady just gets up from the camera and she says, "I can't do this." <laughs> you know, I was like, <sighs> I moved so much, and 
<laughs> you <know>? Okay. So, <laughs> okay. Can, can let's talk about that. So <laughs> India impacted you. Maybe you saw like a, a different expression of Christianity or or a different. Just like, in it, it was like in it, this excitement and. And I think we've all, it's it's funny, you go overseas and you see the Lord doing stuff that maybe we're not seeing so much here. You know, we're watching people get healed. We're seeing when someone, you know, presents the gospel, the response is insane. And so it's, I wanted that, you know, it's like, I didn't want to go back to American Christianity after that. I was like, I want this excitement. I want to expect that when we show up, God's going to show up and do something. And so you kind of brought brought the fire back with you. Brought the fire back to a, a more conservative, <laughs> you okay. know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, by yeah. no means is cross. I don't, you know. Sorry, you're not. They're not conservative, but they definitely, you know, they're not like a, um, a charismatic, you know, Pentecostal church by any means. Okay, okay, and and that's so, really what's over there. Yeah, is yeah, that yeah, type yeah. Of stuff. And and so you said that when you first came back from India, it was it was kind of a bit like you're more intense. Like have yeah. a, have have you gotten less intense, or did you just find a place where you fit in more? I you know I've always been intense, but just you know because growing up in Calvary, you know we're taught to teach the Bible, and it's mm-hmm. like you're teaching it word for word. Here in Juno or in Alaska, we were separated, you know from from what Calvary was really doing. And so we hear Chuck's Wednesday night teaching and we think that's how you're supposed to teach all the sure. time. Just mm-hmm. pick mm-hmm. up the Bible, read it and talk through it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what I was raised, you know, kind of hearing, doing. And then when I went there, it was like, oh, there's power in the gospel and taking everything and putting it in and showing Jesus in it. And so I think I've, I've less intense because it's not so recent, you know, it's been years, but um, I'm still a pretty intense Guy, I had a pastor at Crossroads always, on all my notes, I still write this. I'm not kidding. When I teach everything I got on every single page and sometimes twice a page, it says smile and be nice. Yeah, really? Really? Because I get really worked up and excited and sometimes my excitement can come across as, um, or portrayed maybe as just not anger, but like, you know, in that intensity, sometimes, you know, you can cross that threshold of happy excitement to like... Yeah. So, so I have to really be conscious of that when I teach. Okay. Wow. Well, cause you seem, you seem nice. <laughs> you're a nice guy. I'm a, but yeah. If you forget to smile though, when you're really worked up, sometimes people can take it wrong, you know? Yeah. Especially yeah. when you're talking about sin or something, it's of like, course. they almost feel like you're beating them up. And that's the last thing I want to do is beat people up. So. Absolutely. Yeah, I remember in the early days of my preaching, writing on my notes, slow down, because I had, a, you know, not for an intensity, but almost more like a nervousness where I would just like hurry up to get to get through all of yeah. it. And yeah. And I, I found that it didn't do me any good to write slow down on the top of my notes. I would have to actually insert it mid page. Mid page is where, where I do it. Is, yeah. It's actually yeah, where yeah. I do it. Because <laughs> I'll skip over it on the top. It's got to be like. Right between. <laughs> it's got to surprise you. Yeah, it's got to catch you <laughs> off guard. And I do it in big red, like 16, you know, <laughs> font letters, you know, wow. smile, be nice. <laughs> so okay. so when I teach, you'll see this, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> 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 Not really. So, okay, so you're, you're, you're we're kind of going like geographically anyway. So like we started in California, you went up to, to Alaska, you're, what? you're down in Portland and eventually you end up back in Alaska again. Back in Alaska, and, yes. Um, uh, and let's, let's, jump, let's jump there. So you, you've said that currently you are like preaching occasionally at your church and you're also filling in for a lot of other churches around the area. Is yeah, that- some of the smaller churches around here, um, yeah, I get a fill in for. And that's, and that's fun because they're so different. Mm-hmm. The, the church that I filled, I filled in the most at is a, is a Baptist church, and they're a cessationalist Baptist church, uh, King James only. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's a lot of fun, <laughs> you know, teaching from the kingdom. It's just, to me, that stuff's kind of exciting, you know, trying new things. And I really have to watch my temperament there. Okay. Um, so you, you went to India, and you got all fired up and more, more Pentecostal than ever. And yeah. now, <laughs> what, once a month or something, you're preaching at a cessationist church. How do you, like, how do you manage that? Or is that something that you... Um, I, I look at it as a respect for the house, man. I, I stood up, asked the pastor, he's a good friend of mine. And I said, what are the no-nos, 
right up front, you know, mm-hmm. and he said, well, we don't, you know, really teach on the gifts of the spirit. And, and he, he knows me and he's just, he's a level headed guy. It's just, you know, he's in the Baptist, this Baptist uh, mm-hmm. denomination. So he applies to, you know, or, or, or goes along with what, and I don't even know his stance necessarily Sure, sure. On it, I've never really dug, but so I just respect the house, and I don't. You know, yeah, sounds, talk about sounds the like gifts. yeah. Well, sounds like you're really honoring them. You're not, I, you know. Yeah, I, I don't want to go in and make waves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because so you're serving them by. Yeah. Is it once a month or is it w- when the needs arise? It's, you're there well, to it's, preach. it's he, you know he travels. Um, his parents aren't doing great, and so all you know it'll be like three, four Sundays in a row, and yeah. So it's kind of fun because you can do little. A mini type of series or something through sure. a book or something. And Jonah and Ruth. <laughs> exactly. It's the small ones, right? Yeah. <laughs> Today we're going to look at the book of Jude, you know, or something. Yes. Yeah. Second John. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool. And so what, what other churches do you end up kind of like filling in on? Um, there, so I, a church, uh, called, um, Sozo church. Okay. Um, I fill in there and they're, they're, uh, they're kind of a Calvary esque type of type of type of church, and, and uh, yeah, that, those are two, those are two of the the main ones that I okay. that I'll teach at, and and then you know now I'm in a a church here in AG uh, for the first time ever in an Assemblies of God, which is a whole new experience, okay, but exciting, and, and yeah. I just taught there last Sunday, and uh, well, this is yeah, it's really really exciting. As um, so I as you know, for me, I'm, I'm pastoring in Ireland and, um, you know, we have, you know, a lot of kind of smaller churches around, uh, most churches, uh, at least in the early stages, yeah, don't have more than kind of one preacher or one person able to preach. And so I remember in those early days, just kind of like just scrambling and hoping and trying to find somebody to come in and like to get a Sunday off. Um, and yeah. so to, I, I, I rejoice to hear that you're there to kind of serve the, the community churches there it, yeah. and, and those leaders. And then of course the, the congregations themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're also diverse and different, which makes it fun, you know? Yeah. What I really want to talk to you about and what I think could really serve our audience the best is, could you talk to us about like bivocational ministry? Um, so it sounds like you're preaching quite a bit. And you also have like a full time job, uh, or yeah. probably more than full time job. More right? than full time, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. How does that work when you don't have, let's say, the luxury of? It works. It works a lot better than uh, you know. In the past, what I've done is I've I've pastored full time, you know, sixty hours a week, and done my business. And so this is definitely a lot more manageable. Um, and it's funny when you do. It's almost like full time ministry is 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 hard for me to do because it's like the thing. It's almost like you, the thing you love, and then it's a job, and they both gang up and take on your family. Does that make sense? In other words, it's like it's all competing for time, and my family always loses. And so, really, it's been nice coming back here, being able to just focus on my work, but really focus on my family, loving my family, and really, you know, pastoring and shepherding my family first and foremost. But, but uh, you know, because I have my own shop, I, we were talking earlier, and I don't have internet in my shop. You know, I got my phone, so, but I do a, most 90% of my studying when I'm teaching there because I can just listen to the, through the Bible. I mean, that's what I do is I put on like street lights. You ever heard Street Lights Bible app? Yeah, I, I discovered it recently. I love it. I, I listened to it today, actually. That's, my, that's been my jam for, gosh, since it started. Um, yeah, I met those guys at a conference and when they were first starting and just backed them, got behind it and just loved it. But I, I listen to that pretty much all day long, that and different podcasts or teachers, but mainly that. And so I can do a lot of like the ideas of where I want to go, what's, what I'm looking through and, and um, there. And so I do most of my studying there. But it's, it's weird because Saturdays, you know, I heard you talking on a podcast recently about Saturdays being your day off for Saturday is not my day off when I'm teaching, you know, that's, that's my big, make sure it's all done and all ready. So Saturdays aren't my family day necessarily, you know? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I remember the conversation that you, with, with Tony Carter, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we were just both agreeing, oh man, whatever you do, make sure that you don't 
work on your sermon on Saturdays. And kind of as we we're just like agreeing back and forth, I kind of remembered, wait a minute, what about all the bivocational people? And that is what they have to do. And you know, if you're working all day, I know, you've got I one know. day, you know, yeah. or one so, day to really polish it and focus on it. So you were kind of listening in on two, I hate to, you know, kind of privileged people um, talking about the, the priority of keeping Saturdays open. Yeah. But that's, that's actually not a possibility for you. No, I would say with bivocational people, it's definitely not a possibility. I mean, unless you got a job where you can do it there, but the reality is, is yeah, I mean, to do a good teaching, you need to put hours into it. And so mm -hmm. um, Saturdays becomes my get it all together. You know, I got all the ideas. I know where I'm going, but now let's yeah. get it down and, and polish it. And Yeah, yeah. I mean, without, without like prying too much. So how, how do you, like, are you able to kind of make it up uh, to your family to Sunday afternoon, like devoted family time or? That is the cool thing about being, because I own my own business. You know, I'm my own boss. Um, sometimes I say I have a really strict, mean boss. Um, but, so I can take time off whenever, which is nice. Uh, my kids come spend a lot of time at the shop with me. Um, to relieve my wife from having to be, you know, just constantly with them. They're at an age, they're, uh, I almost said six and eight, eight and 10. They're eight and 10. <laughs> <laughs> eight and 10 little girls, you know, and they got a lot of energy and a lot of emotion. And uh, so my wife needs a break. Okay. And so I, so I take them at my shop. And you're able to kind of like chat while you work? Yeah, yeah. Typically, I don't invite a lot of people to my shop while I'm working because it's kind of my sacred space. Sure. Uh, to be honest, um, but your daughters work, are different. <laughs> but my daughters so, are different. They got yeah. a TV. They yeah. got games. They got Legos. Yeah. They got a whole little game uh, spot for them. Okay. So a little hangout spot, you know, fridge full of food and snacks, and <laughs> so they just come and. I'm not as productive when they're there, but that's okay. I'll sacrifice that to sure to hang sure. with them. Okay, well, do you want to maybe like talk us through like your sermon prep routine? And or also here, here's something else too, actually. So as a predominantly, are you, would you say you're predominantly a guest preacher? Or when you're preaching most of the time, it's not your own church, is that right? It's not my, yeah. yeah. You know, I just started, we've been going to this church since November and just okay. love it, love the people. Um, Love just the community, and, and to me, that's huge. You know, when we left Crossroads, stepped away from Crossroads, we started going to a church called Union Chapel okay. in Vancouver. And what drew us in was the community. And this church was it was a it was a Calvary Chapel in Imago Day. You know, Imago Day Church in I Portland. No, so they're kind of a big social justice kind of a, a lot of people would put them in the emergent category. Okay, but these two churches merged, and so it's, it's a crazy. Mix, you know, really yeah, liturgical yeah, yeah. Calvary style church. Wow. And, um, but the community, so to me, that's one of the most important things with, with getting together is that community. Um, that's why we come together. If I want to listen to good teaching, I'll just listen to it on a, on a, a sermon online, right? And so to, I think sometimes we fool ourselves thinking that's what's going to bring everybody in. Um, or I have, you know, mm -hmm. if I can just teach better, I'll grow this and, and really, it's uh, people crave community and that togetherness, and which has really hurt us lately. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's bitter. It's bittersweet to hear you say that because that's almost what we can't have now. Yeah, or at least in a in a yeah. modified, uh, diluted, uh, screened way. But just, but I teach regularly at a Saturday night church. Um, okay, that's that's for people that just can't make it Sunday smaller church kind of ruffian um where we come together we eat a meal together and and you know 40 or so people and then do worship my brother leads worship and it's kind of this banjo folky kind of punky edge mm -hmm. <laughs> worship which is a lot of fun yeah um, songs that everybody knows but puts this twist on them and but i teach fairly regularly there twice a month so with you saying that it's the it's the community that's the most important part or that's what kind of brings people together. Does that do you feel a little bit of a relief as the teacher or preacher that it's not kind of up to you? Yeah. Oh yeah, huge. You know, I mean, I want to I, I want to honor the Lord and want to be obedient to the spirit and his leading and what's going on and and you know and but it is definitely a relief that it's not all on a man, you know, or on my um, what I say, 
Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I want to do it mm-hmm. to the best of my ability, and I think any pastor wants to for sure. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, I've been to a lot of churches where there's zero community, and the teaching's great, the worship's great, but it's like, you know, you're fighting your kids to go because they don't want to go to Sunday school, and that's not fun, you know, yeah. when, you're, when you don't have any friendships there and there's really no excitement to go. Um, you can just watch online, right? Yeah. Which well, is, I think, then, what a lot of people do. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> these days. But that's really, I'm, and yeah. I'm glad you're saying all this, Dan, because, like, the audience of this podcast is people that care a whole lot about sermons and it's, yeah. it's very niche, you know, and it's, I'm, I'm glad to, <laughs> did I ruffle the, some feathers? Well, no, no, <laughs> it's just, it's just, I'm glad to have a reminder for me personally and, and for the rest of us, like, yeah, we want to be excellent. We want to be, you know, our personal study and public proclamation of God's word. We want to be growing in that, but yeah, that's, that's a part of the gathered community. And yeah. it's a part that, you know, everyone hushes down and is quiet for as one person gets the mic and gets to speak. But there's the whole rest of the week. There's the whole rest of the the gathering, the whole, you know, so yeah, we want to be as good as we can, but also realize that church is more than just the part that can be downloaded on a, on a podcast. Yeah. And it's funny, if you look at the early, the New Testament church, it's like, it wasn't about one person Getting up there and, you know what I mean, orating or expositing God's word. It was like this community collective thing. You know, they definitely went through God's word, but it was, you know, they all were a part of it. And I think that's huge. And I don't know how we do that. You know, I've tried to wrestle that in my head. How do you make people feel part of something? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I I mean... I, not to go off on on a on a tangent, but I, I listened to a, a, a sermon today. I, I've dropped my daughter off at school, then I went for a, like a long walk before I came to the office, and I I downloaded something from my friend um, Aaron Aaron Campbell from Antioch uh, Church in Philadelphia, and it was ninety minutes. And I was like, surely this is like a mistake, or there must be dead time on this, or maybe they accidentally recorded the worship set at the end. And uh, it was a teaching. The teaching it was a little long, it was on, the, on the longer side, 55 minutes or so. And, and then at the end, he just says, and guys, how has the Holy Spirit ministered to you right now? What has God, what has God put on your heart right now? How is this hitting you right now? And then they just like pass the microphone around. And it was like an additional 35 minutes of people saying like, you know, the spirit really convicted me about this and I, I need to change. And, uh, and that's you know, the part you remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say, I yeah. mean, that's the part we were Hearing the different voices, I think, is important. And, yeah. And that was yeah. recorded like five or six years ago. And I listened to it on my headphones in Ireland this morning. And and hearing, yeah, like, you know, the you know elderly women that I never know. And somebody was just saying how, you know, it's like a 25-minute walk for her to get to church. And she's finding it hard. And, and that she's sometimes tempted to stay home. And then, you know, the guy's like, all right, who's going to give this lady a lift next Sunday? And like somebody like <laughs> volunteered. And I'm just like, this is incredible. And it was really ministering to me. So it, it, it hit them. And then me as this total outside observer uh, really benefited from it. Uh, so, have you ever read the book Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire? I'm sure you have. I, I reread it like last year, and man, it's gr- uh, uh, that, two years ago I reread it. Wow, yeah, wow. That book's a little, you know, a little to the got the heart. Yeah, I just reread it, and um, yeah, I mean, just that I, yeah, and it's the way they come together and pray, and and anyway, I don't know what made me think of that. Maybe just the people talk, different people talking, and, and yeah, and how and it's, they it's, allow it's a that. Risk. It's a risk. To it's a huge risk. <laughs> to hand the microphone around, you know, but it, it really, it really paid off. Who knows? Maybe that was the only time they ever did it, or maybe it happens all the time. But I've, I've listened to sermons from that church before and they're all nice and tidy 45 minutes. But this one was just like, why is this one so long? <laughs> and, well, there's uh, a trick to handing the mic. You don't let go of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you put it and you don't let go of it. You put it in front of them because when, when you think they're done, <laughs> you yeah. can take it. Yeah, you give him the pat on the back and you start kind of rubbing exactly. the back. All right. You know. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> we all know that trick. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, okay, so sermons <laughs> sermons are important, but yeah. but one important piece of a, a, an important gathering of God's people. Is that, are you comfortable with yeah. that? Or? Yeah, yeah, I would say that's, yeah. I mean, okay. I would say it's up there with, 
I, I mean, in my mind, it's, yeah, I mean, you have to have it in a church. So it's not like we ever want to get rid of it by any means. Mm-hmm. If you're looking to X stuff, that's probably not the thing to X. But, um, but I think there's more. And I think we forget that, that there's more. You know, like, uh, I guess what made me think of that book was just prayer. Mm-hmm. You know, the time spent in prayer, coming together as God's people, crying out to the Lord. And then allowing the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do in his gathering. Um, it's just how do you do that in a large group of people, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's sort of my, how do we do this? But, but I love trying new things. Yeah. Or, or kind of, in, in my context, like how do we do this when church is still online? You know, in, in Ireland, we still haven't met together as a church basically, you know, for, for a year. right. I, I just forget that it's not like er, that we're different than I know than you're most the, of the world. What are you, the last frontier? Is that what you called? We are the last frontier. I, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, the biggest thing. I, people forget how big Alaska is. You know, it's one third over one third the size of the U.S. No way. We look at Texas and we say, "Hey, little guy," you know, everything's bigger <laughs> in Texas. Well, Except hey, little Alaska. guy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I mean, but I, I do realize across the U.S., a lot of churches are open. Uh, but I was just speaking to um, Tabidi Anwabile um, earlier, and his church is still doing the only online thing. So different, everyone's ne- negotiating this. But even, even again, this morning, after listening to that podcast, and then just kind of like mulling it over and thinking about it, how do we facilitate that? Um, you know, we kind of can't, at least in our thing. But what I'm going to try this Sunday for the first time, and this is not exactly the same, but I'm just trying to think outside the box. Um, I'm, I'm teaching through John. I'm going to be in John chapter 17. Um, it's, you know, Jesus's prayer. And I want to like move us towards prayer. Uh, so I'm just going to have some like prayer points and, and record my sermon and then just have a slide with like prayer points. And just leave it up there with no with no background music, with no with no preaching. But just like, okay, we've seen this in John chapter seventeen, verses one to five. Here's some things for you to pray with your family, or here's some things for you to pray even on your own. But we're just going to leave this for the next ninety seconds, even. I'm not, like for some people, and it's it's sad but true. Ninety seconds of uninterrupted prayer has been a long time. It could be the longest that the people some people pray all week long. You know. So I'm going to try to get awkward in a church when you do that. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it could, it's going to be awkward when we do it in people's homes this coming Sunday, (laughs) but I'm trying within these limitations to do it. You, we were talking off camera, you know, what the stuff that we were trying, um, you know, when I was part of Calvary here and, and, and helping do that, you know, where we did it when it was all online, we, we would have the teaching, but we'd also, it would be like we'd have a conversation around it with four people. That's right. Yeah. And 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 my thought behind that was is how do we how do we get other people involved? You know, when it's just a teaching, it's like okay, but now you get four people around talking about how it impacted them or what that, you know, how what the Lord's speaking to them in that, and it kind of get it creates a conversation, um, which was awkward at first because people aren't used to that type of thing. And what's crazy is that church still does that live meeting now. And people love it. Oh, is that um, right? Okay, maybe yeah. maybe explain it for those that haven't haven't seen it. So, so it's kind of four so people on a stool. Is that it? Four people on stools. Yeah, I mean, you, you do run it like a typical service, but the teaching now is cut down. You know, down to about twenty five minutes. That way, you can have about fifteen minutes of conversation um, right after the teaching with four people on stools, and they just talk about you know what the Lord's how the Lord's ministering to them in that. And, and, you know, we really fought hard against like, what does this mean to you type of stuff? Because we know that, w- that God's word means what it says. And there's, there's one interpretation, but we know that there's much application. And so that's what we wanted to hit is the application because the application is huge. A lot of churches don't do application in their teaching. And to me, it's almost like this shotgun blast where I need mm, okay. application. Okay. And so I teach with application. Um, you know, I'll go through God's word, but I make it, I want to give application to people. And so that's really all it was about was making it applicable and, and, and talking about that. I figure four different people might represent everybody they, or they could possibly represent most thoughts. And yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's excellent. What a, what a great way. And, and so you said they're continuing to do that now, <clears throat> not just online. Hmm. They do it live in person and it's online too, but, but yeah, they got about a hundred people that okay. come live and, and they do it just that way still. Ah, that's, that's killer. Well, Hey, so, you, uh, so we've had a little yeah, sorry, bit. I, don't, I keep derailing us from, 
<laughs> Look, no, man. I am like sidetrack Billy here, so you got to be careful with me. So as I was saying, so how do you prepare <laughs> your your messages? I would just love to hear how much. Yeah. So so a lot of it is it is like this this audio Bible kind of just gets into your yeah. your head or and because I'm not regularly teaching, it's not like I can say, hey, we're going to go through the Book of Acts and spend the next year in the Book of Acts. You know, for me, all my spots are like one-off type of things with the exception of that church um so so i'm i go in and i do exactly where they're at and they're in corinthians right now and so that's fun just pick up where the last guy left off Mm -hmm. but because i'm doing guest stuff mostly it's like most of the time it is going to be more of a topical type of thing okay um but because my background is going through God's word, I always, you know, that's my basis, but I always do topical. And so it's kind of fun. So really, I just spend time in prayer, listening to God's word. And reality, what it comes down to is most 99.999% of the times I'm teaching, it's something that the Lord just nails me on. Just bunk. I'll be reading and it just jumps out and it's impacted me. You know, the knife goes in me. So now I want to take it out and I want to start putting it in everybody else type of mentality. Um and so that's really what most of my teaching is, is stuff that the Lord just, you know, while I'm reading his word, the Holy Spirit just like jumps something out at me and I never saw that before or whoa, you know, and that's, and I'll build it around that. So you might have that kind of, that experience or that, that Holy Spirit stab wound that happens during the week and you just kind of think about it and mull it over and then ride it out on Saturday? Yeah, think about, well, no, I've got, I've got it all written down before, but really it's polished by Saturday. So I'll have my laptop in my shop and, and I'll just be jotting things down and, 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 and try to pit, do a story, you know, create it as a story of, of what's going on, what's, what's, you know, that story idea of teaching. Um, I like to do things around a story. I think people relate to that and, and um, because the, the ex. The ex, you know, the expository at that point, that's much easier. I mean, not easier oh, for me, I but agree. it's just, it's, I agree. But, but creating how well, I think I do I, it. <laughs> yeah. The study that goes into that isn't though. I mean, the amount of commentaries, uh, my wife is, is laughs at them because I have, I'm a book nut. Like I like paperback books. So yeah, I got all my commentaries on logos and stuff, but, but I also have all of them in hardback. And so, and I really <laughs> enjoy looking at them in hardback, you know? Um, but no, I do a lot of study around the expository and, and going through God's word. But the hardest I think for me is creating the story around it. What is, what is, what am I actually trying to say here? Or what is the Lord actually trying to say here? I should put it that way. And how do I make it applicable and how do I bring it all together? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's so when you say story, what do you, what do you mean? Like, are you talking about like kind of like plot development and conflict and resolution? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, who just did that book? Um, uh, the Hillsong guy, I'm spacing his name now that just, just put out that book. I think you had him on there. I saw his name. Um, Robert Ferguson. Yes. Robert yes. Ferguson is, is, yes. is kind of a, I don't want him to watch it. It's kind of a dumped down easy way to do it, and, and which is great. I mean, don't worry, he, he doesn't. Grab... He doesn't. He's not listening. Okay. Don't worry. <laughs> so I, I don't mean dumbed down, in, but but simple to where anybody can grab that concept now and and revise it and make it their own. And and, and I love that. And and really, that's all I'm doing is something similar to that. Okay. Um, I do more just the story, the tension, and then get into the expository. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rather okay. than doing other stuff, because really that's what's that's where the that's where the revelation and stuff's going to come from is right yeah. there. And so I think that's I, I would rather be at God's word than my opinion or my what I think. You know, yeah, seven yeah, steps see, to be happier. It's like, well, God's word tells us how to be happy. You know, tells us how to, and so that's the revelation to me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And because, um, a, that was a fantastic interview. And if you haven't listened to it, um, you have, I'm talking to everybody else. You should go check it out. It's it's really great. Um, but what, um, what myself and Nick, as we were speaking to him, we kind of, you know, 
he he has the you know the the story from his own life and then like connecting to the broader story and then a little bit of kind of a topical thing and then a little bit of exposition right before the end and we're kind of thinking like um the exposition is kind of the cool part you know that's the great part that's, that's, and, that's the huge that's the part that's really gonna get you yeah it's god speaking you know rather yeah. than dan speaking and and so I don't go into much story of myself. I'll just kind of lay it out there, the story, and maybe tell something something that's happened to me. And I never try to paint myself in some great way because it feels really awkward. I'm sure mm. you understand that. Mm -hmm. I normally use myself as a bad example. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I'll tell something short in there just so people are like, oh, if it didn't make sense when I'm explaining it, now they get it. Let's get yeah. God's word. Well, see, recently, like I actually told the story where I did the where I did the right thing, and that was the first time in a long. Did it feel time. awkward? It, it totally did. It totally <laughs> did. And I and I kind of ran it by like some of the leaders first, and I said, "Listen, I'm planning on telling this story about me being a good dad, and um, like it feels weird." And uh, one of them was saying, "Like, well." You, you tell stories about how you're a loser all the time. <laughs> and so, so maybe they nice. need to hear yeah, that you're it's nice every <laughs> once that you in a have while some victory know. in Christ, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that there's that there is that balance, you know, because on there's the one a, I guess I have told stories about myself, but it's always like this is it's God. Like it, I'm a loser. <laughs> you know, that's nothing yeah. to do with me. I was just obedient and God used. Yeah. situation because so. if people if all they ever hear is that you know their pastor's an idiot whose life is a mess and is just full of failure eventually are they going to be like why should i come to this church anymore? yeah how, what am i how can i learn from this guy if it's not affecting him and changing yeah. him yeah so there's a there's a way to do it and you don't want to be you know i think maybe you know we're we're of a certain age maybe there's a certain like a previous generation where like you know the, the pastor's always the hero of the story you know constantly and that's you know, we don't like that, but I, I'm concerned about the danger of just always being the big loser idiot, you know? So well, we've, again, we've I'm, seen that shift. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Where you remember early, the first conferences I went to Bible conferences, it was like, I remember hearing this and to this, this day it stuck out at me and, and it just rubbed me wrong. But they said, don't pastors don't bleed on your sheep. In other okay. words, don't let them know anything going on in your life. Don't let them know your failures. And I just remember being like, no, people need to know that we're human and we fail, but they also need to see the power of, of Christ in us. Um, but that always stuck it. But I think we've gone, you know, I've heard pastors just openly talking about their sin and it's like, whoa, it, but almost in a way where it's okay because we all are going to sin type of men thought. And it's just... And so I think we've swung that other way with some of the younger generation. Yeah. Or using the language, not of sin, but of brokenness. Um, you know, we're all broken. And, and again, there's truth in that. Like There's but, truth in that. Yeah. We're, we're broken. But it's half the loved, truth. And we're being made put together. And, you know, yeah. I'm actually reading a book right now called, you know, about spiritual formation as if the church mattered by... Uh, by James Wilhoit. And he's just talking about like there, there should be progress. Like there is, there is growth that should be evident, you know, like Paul told yeah. Timothy, you know, like, um, let your growth be evident to all. So and there's a, there's a balance. There's a, there's gotta be a, a caution and maybe, you know, us millennials or zennials or gen X, whatever we are. I'm, what am I? I think they call me as zennial or something. I, yeah. We're, we're zennials. We're special. Yeah. <laughs> We're, we're, we're the specialist unique We were snowflakes. so special that, that someone had to make up a new name for we're us. We're a micro generation. <laughs> but yeah, we have our own unique challenges as Xennials, as whatever we are. But yeah, uh, just, just to be aware of them and um, don't want to only just react against what's gone before us. And then two, the, here's the thing, Dan. We're pastors now, you know? That means there's younger people that are hearing us. And they're going to react against us, you know? So oh. in, in, tw in, 20, in 2040, there's going to be preachers that are like dealing with like, well, you know, Pastor but, Dan always did this. And I, I, so here I am like this. And that's, that's horrifying, frankly. It is because, wow, we could be in a mess in 20 years if we're still here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Oh, gosh. I, you know, the Lord's really been showing me lately that just, this isn't that I, I think we see a lot of people during this time have, have pulled away from community, pulled away from holiness. I know in the first part of Corona, I started slipping in areas that I know the Lord was like, no. And, you know, using my liberty as an excuse. And the Lord just nailed me and showed me that this is a time that if it's not 
profitable, we need to start laying things down. Um, th- this is a time to become, uh, you know, to drive into holiness, not just in these last days. I mean, we I think we're all pretty on the same page in the church that we're closer now than we've ever been to Christ's return. And, and, and I want to be, you know, I want to hear the well done, good and faithful servant. I want to be, I want to drive closer into Jesus, not, not mimic what the world around us is Hmm. doing Hmm. as things are getting more acceptable evils, more, you know, or glorified even now. And I see that in a lot of the churches, um, sadly, just, yeah, especially living in Portland, you know, it was it was a uh, it was it was an experience seeing where most of the churches are um, affirming. Most okay. of the churches have really bought into a lot of just just the culture of that area, and yeah. it was just yeah. and I almost started to, and I think that's another reason the Lord called us back here. It was just kind of that eyes open, like wow. I felt like Lot in a sense, you know. Okay. There, where I started, you know, you start, and and I don't want to be that, you know. We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. And I don't know why I was even all bringing that up, you know. But anyway, yeah, I hope that helps someone. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's 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 yeah, it's a a, a a challenging, sober word. This, you know, Dan, this episode is going to be like no other episode at all. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Your ratings are tanking, man. <laughs> Um, no, so, so, so what, what have we heard so far? We've heard that sermons are great, but not that important. Um, yeah, and, just, and, uh, uh, you know, holy, holiness matters and the Lord's coming back. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, Hey, okay, Last, last question. Like, okay. so, so how are you trying to improve? Like as, as a teacher and preacher, like, are you, are you trying to get better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, for sure. I haven't arrived, you know, I haven't taught long enough. I I mean, I taught steady, you know, weekly and sometimes twice weekly for three years. And that's the most I'd ever done. And so now that it's pulled back, really, I wouldn't even, I mean, I don't know if I could say that I've even developed my own. I mean, I think I have because my personality and I'm older and I'm not a kid trying to mimic things. But at the same time, I still listen to so much. I listen to such a wide variety of teaching. And I think that really, hmm. that's one way I'm trying yeah. to get better is I listen to so many different people. I mean, everybody from Chuck Misler to, you know, all the way to, um, you know, some of the more big whatever guys. And, 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 I, and I learn from all of them about yeah. how, how to connect with your audience, how to speak God's word, how to, what not to do. A lot of times it's like, oh, well, I won't do that. Hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But just and then time in prayer, man, spending more time in prayer. I've been really focusing on that lately, just designated prayer time, you know, half an hour of just uh, spending time with the Lord in prayer and okay. solid prayer. So more more than the 90 seconds that I'm going to give my More than the ni- awkward 90 seconds. I do an yeah. awkward 30 minutes. <laughs> awkward 30 minutes. Wow. <laughs> Somebody was telling me once that they decided they were gonna they were gonna pray for a half hour, and so they set a timer on their phone, and so they like you know got on their knees for thirty minutes, and, and you know nothing. There was no alarm that went off, and they were like, maybe my phone isn't, maybe my alarm. It's been at least thirty minutes, hasn't it? You know, maybe it's four. And they checked their phone, and it's been like six minutes because <laughs> they hadn't built up that kind of muscle. You know, like I have prayed for everyone that I know, everything that I know. I've put on the armor of God, and it's only been six minutes. Uh, it's that awkward silence. I think sometimes we forget, and I forget that prayer isn't. It isn't talking at God. It's a conversation with God. And so how are we listening in that? You know, we're all just stop and just listen. Like, Lord, what are you speaking? I'm I'm just laying all this to you. You know, what do you now want to speak to me? And and that's the that's where it gets real awkward sometimes. Especially when you're in like a congregational setting of just waiting on the Lord, you know. <laughs> I'm always the guy that's like, okay, and I gotta say so, you know, to kill the silence, but but that's, I think, a muscle that yeah is important. Lord, what do you want to speak to me? Okay, so you're you're trying to improve your like receptivity to, Rec- to the Lord in prayer. Is that yeah, yeah? And then just really lots of studying, man. I still 
study like I'm teaching all the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, and maybe it's, I don't want to lose that, that teaching muscle or something or that study type of muscle, but, um, I, or I just enjoy it, man. I, I'm kind of a nerd like that. I forget that not everybody's wired that way where they like yeah. to read commentaries and like to like yeah, really yeah, study yeah, God's yeah. word. I, I don't know if it's more common than I think or, or, or la- I don't know, but I talk to people about it and they're looking at me like, what, <laughs> you know, you didn't heard. Yeah. I've found that. I found that you're, you're correct. Most people don't, don't, don't care as much. Not that they don't love God, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. But it's um, not wired that yeah. maybe that's not their calling or their wire. I don't know. And one of my problems is like, I, through this podcast, I get to talk to other nerds all the time. And, uh, yeah, and also I'm, I'm in a seminary right now. So I'm doing these, you know, seminary courses. So I'm able to like through zoom and like, I, I talk to people that are, that are exactly like me or, or variations thereof. And, and that's good. It's helping my brain to expand, but it's, it's actually, if that's the only input that I have, it makes me like a, a terrible pastor because in my church, there's like hardly anyone who cares about the nuances of this or that. And that's okay. It's, it's good. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Most people don't read commentaries for fun. <laughs> Most people like the only sermon that they hear all week is mine. They're not like binge listening sermons like how I do and other people do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so that means that I don't need to get into the nuances of like, well, this current controversy, you know, or did you hear about Beth Moore leaving the Southern Baptist convention? Like they don't care and, and they don't need I- to care. Yeah, they don't need to. Yeah, I, you know what's I, fascinating too is is putting yourself in the shoes of the layperson, and I know that's a weird way, to, but I've you we've been part. Of, I was part of churches where worship starts, nobody's there until the teaching starts, then everybody's there. But going from that atmosphere to people wanting more worship than teaching was a big shift, and it it just shows you that. You know, it's all important to me. I mean, to me, worship is just as important as the teaching. That time of communal praising God communally together as a people is just as important as hearing a teaching. And sometimes I enjoy that more because I can listen to a teaching, but I can't get communal worship with my brothers and sisters outside of communal worship with my brothers and sisters. Totally, totally. And, and, and I think this generation is really into worship. <laughs> I mean, more so than maybe some in the past. And yeah, sometimes I think it's only, things are only big in my own head. I had a pastor who used to say that to me all the time. It's only big in your own head. And I think uh, as pastors, we forget a lot of times that it's only big in our own head, the importance of teaching. We know it's important, but mm-hmm. really it's only big in our own heads. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, Dan... Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, we've sorry, I can I can ramble. We've, we've hit every topic <laughs> on my list, and then and more. seven, and then seven more. But as I said, this is a, an episode like like none other. Uh, but I I you know I, I appreciate you. Um, it's just been so good, you know, that our our paths have come back together, and yeah, uh, I just I just love that that your blessing. It sounds like you know three churches on the regular, and and probably even more that I don't know about. So it's it's really exciting. Um, how, 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 two questions. How can people hear your sermons? Is there a place online where, where people can, can find a good Dan Ewing sermon? If you Google you, there's a lot of other people with the same name, but where? Yeah, there's a underwear model. So careful on that one. <laughs> Some guy. Um, I, I get that a lot. People are like, I Googled your name. It's like, yeah, no, that's not me. Obviously. <laughs> it's not me. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess just, ooh. Facebook, the different places on Facebook. Okay. Um, you can find it on Crossroads Archives. You can find it on Calvary Juno's archives and guest teaching. Um, and we'll put some links in the show notes. Um, I'll, I'll get some links from you. Um, yeah. But actually, yeah, I was I was actually trying to find some of your sermons even before this interview, and I I couldn't do it. <laughs> um, no, it's yeah, it's not. You just have to go to the church. You know, I just sure. taught this last Sunday at Juno Christian Center, the church we're at now, and so Juno Christian Center, Juno, the latest teaching is me. 
Okay. And, uh, and then final question is how can people support your, uh, your vocation? How can we get involved? How can we, like, if people wanted to like put food on your family's table, how can we do that? Uh, well, you, well, you know, I guess other, I do leather work for a living and I have um, a company called Ewing Dry Goods and we do kind of high end men's and, and some women's, but mainly men's um, accessories, wallets and belts and, and all that type of stuff. But EwingDryGoods.com, if they're on Facebook, Ewing Dry Goods, that's E-W-I-N-G, Dry Goods. Um, and, and, if, and if it's not for them and they can't afford it, because I, I admittedly I am in the upper echelon of the leather world. Um, tell your friends who are into fancy things. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I've I've got a, a Ewing dry good belt, and I can say that um, it's it's been shrinking over the past years. There's something Isn't that weird. I know. I buy this wrong shrinking with this belt, leather. Man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the quarantine shrink, man. I've gotten a lot of that. <laughs> My yeah. belt, man. It didn't stretch. It shrunk. Yeah. Um, some, yeah. Some people have gotten the the quarantine fifteen. Um, some people put on the COVID-19, <laughs> but, uh, and then I put on the, I put on the 2020, 20, <laughs> so the 2020, 20, 2021. Now, oh, I yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm getting no more, no more. Yeah. It ends. Well, now. it's been good talking to you, man. I, I, I appreciate you and what you're doing, man. I sure hope people like listen to this or even if they don't, I don't care this. I really enjoyed this. So <laughs> you just put um, a crazy picture. People like weird. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Who's this Dan Ewing guy? You know, maybe that'll be it. <laughs> yeah. This guy I know, this guy I know, but who's Dan Ewing? You know, almost like Whoa, that. Oh, yeah. I know. Sons, <laughs> Sons of Siva, yeah. All right, cool. Hey, I hope that this episode and all that we do at the Expositors Collective helps you to grow in your personal study and your public proclamation of God's word. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dan. That was a, a real delight. And uh, thanks to you for listening all the way to the end. Uh, make sure that you hit up Ewing Dry Goods and you go buy yourself uh, some high-end leather products and, uh, and support the ministry of, uh, of Dan and, and his family. So, uh, so that's exciting. Um, again, let me remind you again, um, we have an ongoing giveaway right now uh, to win some copies of Scott Erickson's books. Uh, no giveaways for the leather products, so you got to pay for those yourself. Um, and uh, I'm going to, I really hope that you're subscribed to this because in just a few days, our next episode is coming out and it's with Glenn Scrivener. He is the chief evangelist and the leader of the Speak Life uh, evangelistic ministries in the UK, and uh, and that conversation is uh, is one that you're really going to put on your thinking hat for. Um, he's a very clear thinker, and uh, we really tease out uh, some implications, not just of the practice of preaching, but of the theology of preaching itself. So I'm going to leave you with a clip from Glenn, and I will see you on Tuesday. So I hope that this episode and all that we do at the Expositors Collective help you to grow in your personal study and your public proclamation of God's Word. So we have a sense that preaching is important, but then why on earth should that guy spend 30 minutes when, why, why shouldn't he just read out? you know, Philippians, why, should, why, should, why shouldn't he just read the, the whole thing? Why, why do we have to be in, why, why does he have to inflict his blessed thoughts on that chapter <laughs> on us? And I, I really had no idea for the first, at least the first kind of seven, eight years of, of preaching. Of you doing it. Of me doing it. Yeah. And I, I went away to seminary. I went to um, a Bible college called Oak Hill in North London. And it, it, it's got a great reputation. And it, 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 is, it is a great, you know, theological college. Um, but we really didn't get a theology of preaching. We, we, all, we all just assumed that the Bible is important. So let's try and, and be biblical in, you know, whatever time is allotted to us on a Sunday morning. And so that that really made me want to do a deep dive into um, a theology of preaching. And I, I found um, Martin Luther and, and Karl Barth's theology of the word, um, the, the threefold word, um, as really transformative and, and as giving me a sense of why it is that anyone would dare to speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Um, and that, give, that gave me a theological rationale 
for the kind of tone that I'd always responded to in preaching. Okay. Um, because the tone that I respond to is when people get up and say, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And then they let loose with, yeah, yeah. you know, fiery oratory, Martin Lloyd-Jones, logic on fire, right? I, I'd always responded to that, but I just thought that was a temperamental thing. Hmm. And then seeing that, you know, Martin Luther saying, look, there's the threefold word, that Christ is the eternal word of the Father, that the scriptures are the word of Christ, and preaching is the word of the Spirit. And you've got a kind of a trinity, word of the Father, word of Christ, word of the Spirit. And when you get all three together, and to the degree that you get all three together, then you are hearing God's voice with his authority. And and that's just kind of, and that again makes you realize that preaching is not a frivolous activity and it's not just a Bible study, mm, not just okay. a, a spoken Bible commentary. It's God addressing his people through the lips of a preacher. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.